For ancient and modern Pueblo people, corn is much more than a food source. It is a cultural and spiritual necessity. It's our symbol of, of being Hopi. It's our soul, they say. Corn is also central to the research of the archaeologists who study the ancient Pueblo culture. Pueblo Indian culture, at least for an archaeologist, really begins with the introduction of corn farming. These two perspectives on the importance of corn have come together at the Crow Canyon Archaeological Center. Crow Canyon is located in the richest archaeological region of the United States, near Mesa Verde National Park. Their research focuses on the ancestral Pueblo people who lived in the Mesa Verde region for over 2,000 years before migrating to New Mexico and northern Arizona where their descendants live today. Crow Canyon has ongoing consultations with American Indians about our research and education programs. And one of the things the tribes wanted to see was more research on ancestral Pueblo agricultural practices and how those might be the same or different than the way that Pueblo people farm today. We convened a conference that brought several tribal agricultural experts to Crow Canyon and together we conceived of the Pueblo farming project. We decided to use Hopi as our consultants because Hopi is one of the few groups that still practices direct precipitation agriculture, where the only moisture that the crops receive is what falls from the sky. The Hopi are a Pueblo Indian tribe who live in 12 villages atop high mesas in northeastern Arizona. Several of their many clans trace their history to the Mesa Verde region. The Pueblo Farming Project is designed to help us understand ancestral Pueblo agriculture. And the way we're doing that is by creating experimental gardens on Crow Canyon's campus. It's still good. This is a lot Ooh, better than the one up there. Yeah. Okay. Let's so this is pretty. Man, that's nice. All right, good. There's a windbreak right there, so you might want to plant corn on this side and then beans over on beans. this side. Okay. Mm. The white corn would probably, yeah. white and yellow corn. Okay, we'll just I, try a, maybe a couple or several rolls of that. We figured this is as close to archaeological sites as, mm -hmm. as any of the gardens we're going to plant. It's very difficult to find evidence for agricultural fields today. But what we can document is where people were locating their houses. People were putting their houses directly on what are the best soils for agriculture today. So from that, we infer that they had farms right around the locations where they built their houses. Farmers like Mike Coffey dry farm in the same places as the ancients. Mike's son, Grant, gave up farming for archaeology. He used to take off with his little pack and his notebook when he was about this tall, and I thought, this is serious. And it turned out it really was. <laughs> the main thing that got me interested was just the excitement. There's something very visceral about picking up an old object that you know somebody made a very long time ago. And just to pick it up and touch it and turn it over and look at it and wonder about the people who made it. When I'm on the track or working, working ground, you see artifacts daily. Hammerstones, choppers, these are all picked up right here in the, in the midden area, and I just throw them out to keep from running them over with the tractor any worse than they already are. It's always been part of my life. To me, these guys are almost an antecedent. They're doing the same thing I'm doing. They had the same, same problems I have. And whether they were more successful than I am, I'm, I'm not sure but what they might be. <laughs> but I know that it's dry, was dry for them, it's dry for us. I'm sure they've had floods all that stuff is repeats, and I would love to have been able to talk to some of them and see how they handled the situation. The best way we have for trying to understand ancestral farming is to work with modern Pueblo farmers who are still using those traditional techniques. Uh, oh, 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 oh,
My mother, my father, you want rain in your fields, rain. My mother, my father, you want puddles in your field. So above them, clouds, rain clouds are forming and lightning and thundering as it's raining. That's what it talks about. And that's the that's a good song for the field. Down <laughs> All females are pure in spirit, so with their spirit, the crops will grow, and that's why I had them dance here. See those clouds? They're answering you. <laughs> the Hopis taught the staff and interns of Crow Canyon how to plant corn in the traditional way. When we look at our crops, we look at them as our children, like you're our children. That's how we look at our plants. We treat them like that. And so when you go to your field, you sing a song, and your children will hear you, hear you sing, and they'll, they'll say, our dad is coming. Where? Then they'll tiptoe, try to look over the horizon, and that's how they grow. And that's how you grow, right? When you see your when you see your mom and your dad come home from work, dad is coming, you're looking up the window, right? That's how you're doing exactly what they're doing too. Um so how long have you been farming these corn and beans? Since Hopi people first set foot in in south uh, western Arizona, they came they came with the seeds and they, you know, planted so it's time immemorial. Now some of our Hopi people have tractors, but this would be the um, original way they plant with a planting stick. Why would you prefer the old traditional way over the tractors? Because they have significance to our life, to our culture. And as for the other one, you know, it's, it doesn't mean anything. But the, in our, in our uh, culture, that signifies something. It also, it also has a meaning in our, in our religious ceremonies. So that's why we prefer that. This can become a lost tradition at some point, but through sacred instructions, we're trying to uphold that by, by getting involved with even studies like this, you know, so that we can perpetuate our uh, ancient techniques. I don't think Hopi would survive traditionally, religiously, if there was no corn. Our entire lives are based on the corn, the life of the corn. You know, we received the gift of the corn from our spiritual deities, and we also made a commitment to follow the Hopi way of life, and that was to submit to this kind of harsh environment. With the corn we have now with no irrigation, depending totally on faith for nature to bring us moisture and harvest. <laughs> The dents in here, they represent all seeds of life. People, animals, insects, birds, mammals, ocean life, air, rock, clouds. It represents the world, the life of the world. And that's what you have in your hand when you're planting. So when you're planting, you're in good hearts and you're singing. Because 
you're planting life roots for the whole world. You always plant this in, in the ground at your field. That will represent the heartbeat. And the cloud people, when they come around, they know that that field is alive because that field's heart is beating. To us cornists, there are people. They're not only just, just plants or food, but medicinal and spiritually, that's how we treat them. The, the corn, you know, they're our food. And spiritually, because we, we pray with corn, it goes, it goes far. It's, it's not just science, it's not just numbers. Maize. Zia maize is the premier crop that the New World gave to the whole world. Our current understanding is the first corn was domesticated about 9,000 years ago, south and west of Mexico City. It's been in the American Southwest for 4,000 years. There's a lot of food value in these. When the crop comes in, you've got your food for the winter. Its ancestor was a little grass known as teosente. It had little, what they call, cupulate fruit cases that stacked one on top of the other, and nature broke the top one off and it fell to the ground, and then the next one. This was all in natural dispersion. Well, when humans got interested in it and eventually got this thing called the corn ear, it's surrounded by uh, leaves known as husks. It's completely tightly enclosed. So this thing cannot self-plant. Whenever you find corn in an archeological site, it is an absolute certainty that this is a domesticated crop. Once farming was introduced, it created a whole series of changes that totally transformed human society. Corn was a reliable food source that could be stored for the future. A stable food source led to population growth, larger communities, and more complex societies. In around 1300 AD, the ancestral Pueblo people left their settlements and moved south. For a long time, it didn't rain, so uh, plants are not doing very good. I feel I feel really sad for the corn. It really impacts life as Hopi a lot because we do year-round work with corn in our ceremonies, and preparation of foods and the deities is all our our harvest. Everybody put a stop on all the things that they were had planned to do that year, weddings, dances, whatever, because of the, we didn't have enough harvest. The men were going around from different places to watching to see if anybody brought any, at least one truckload up. Nobody brought any truckload. We just brought like armfuls and that's it. And that was bad. That was really bad. And I swear that these men were crying. Some of them cried because they couldn't, they didn't have any harvest. Even if there's one plant that's surviving, I'm going to stay in here and hopefully, you know, making the others come back. So that, that's going to be, that's going to be my prayer. It has been and it will, you know. So then not only my cross, but the people around us, you know, so they, they can uh, eat and survive too. And the plants, the plants will, you know, shine, shine with, with our culture and in our traditions. You never doubt the cloud people. You always have faith that even though you plant in harsh conditions, then the cloud people will see your, and feel as you do and then they will bring rain and then the corn will grow. Once in a while, he'll take me down to his fields and, you know, have us look at it. And as we walk along, looking at the uh, corn stalks and touching them and feeling them, we talk to them and hope he, I know it's hot, but try. 
encouraging them, and we thank them. Pueblo farmers really had to develop ingenious techniques to be successful farmers in such an arid region. One of the things they did was to develop many varieties of corn that were specifically adapted to this area. Today, the Hopis maintain at least 19 varieties of corn. They are very concerned about the possibility of these traditional varieties being contaminated by modern hybrid corn. It's threatened. We need to do DNA now. And, and I hope my, my corn is still pure, that it's not tainted, but uh, it's out there too in my area. Crow Canyon and the Hopi people entered into a collaborative project to document the genetic characteristics of Hopi corn. This will provide a baseline for future research and tell us whether any contamination has occurred. Just as every person has a different fingerprint, each corn's DNA has its own signature. The Hopi corn turned out to be unique when compared with the DNA of today's hybrid corn. They were all genetically a family, a family, the Hopi corn. The Hopi corn samples were not contaminated by outside varieties of corn. But the Hopis are interested in more than just the purity of their corn. The different colors of Hopi corn are associated with the four cardinal directions and with the Hopi accounts of their clan migrations. The Greasewood clan, Bow clan, Bamboo clan, we came through here. We came through here. We see the archaeological sites as our footprints. The petroglyphs are our footprints. Different landscapes are our footprints. We see it as real when we talk about our history. But I think science may still be thinking that it's a hypothesis, it's a theory to be tested. I think we're still sort of kind of on these sides of the line, so to speak. The Hopi thinks it's real because today we are living clans with that history then I believe the contemporary corn DNA data can be compared to the DNA of, of the older corn. That will reinforce our tradition. And that's really what I'm interested in, that something as humble as corn will help us. The pedigree of these plants, where they came from, even potentially when they came into this region, is probably encoded in the DNA. And you cannot do DNA from these charred uh, bits. At least they haven't been able to up till now, and that doesn't mean that they won't in the future. But if we could get DNA, and if we could link um, corn uh, in one place to corn from other places, we will get some kind of sense of, of the order of introduction of land races into North America, uh, into the American Southwest, and, and how they moved from there afterwards. So if we can track corn DNA across time and space, we are tracking people across time and space. Eventually, it is planned to compare modern Hopi corn with examples of ancient corn from the archaeological record. In that way, we might be able to use these studies to actually trace migrations and unlock the stories of the different Pueblo groups that lived in the Mesa Verde region in the distant past. That would certainly tie the Hopi people into these areas. And that was the goal, and that still is the goal, so that's the next step. <laughs> All the men do is plant. Hold the weeds, take care of it, and then harvest time comes, they harvest, they bring it home. And it belongs to the woman. We're the ones with the seeds. That's how it works. The fresh crops that are gathered feed the community. The harvest when it's dried, that also is prepared in different ceremonial events to feed the people and also our deities.
In addition to learning about yields and how those are affected by annual climate change, we've also learned about how Pueblo people figured out how to farm in such a difficult environment. The Pueblo farmers plant their corn seed deeper than we would so that they can tap into the moisture that's stored in the soil. They plant in clumps, so they're actually growing as many as 12 plants in one clump, which at a certain point they'll thin down to about six plants. They also plant further apart so that each clump doesn't compete with the other clump for the little bit of moisture that's available. They don't harvest until the corn has com completely finished growing, the plant has turned brown, and the ear actually falls over on its side from the stalk. Still have the green, so um, there's still a lot of moisture in here. It won't bear root, so, um, so we'll just take off the dry, the dry part. When they're here helping us with the farming project, they're sharing some things with us that we wouldn't get any other way. And how do you call this kind? This one is called wilkte. Wilkte. See a little blue seed in the middle there? Yeah. As a scientist, I cannot know what the Hopi know. I think they would be quite bemused at what I find of interest. When I describe it in the archaeological record, I count the number of rows and I measure it and I get the diameter and they'd think, what are you doing that for? It's you, Bahamas, that doing everything, all this, all this scientific, which we don't do, see. So, to you it's all right that way, but to us. Now, if you planted this, do you think you would get red or white or you don't know? Red. You will get red from uh -huh. this one? Yeah. The modern Pueblo farmers that we're working with are actually including 4,000 years of cultural knowledge in how they've learned how to farm in such a difficult environment. <laughs> They're not so much interested in numbering each clump and measuring the kilograms of kernels that come from each clump but they are interested in whether <laughs> the methods that they use today would work in this area where their ancestors farmed a thousand years ago. She heard us. The scientific objectives of the Pueblo Farming Project are really interesting and really important to our research here at Crow Canyon. But the real objective of our work here at Crow Canyon, our research, is to better understand culture, to understand ancestral Pueblo Indian culture and how it links to the culture of the Pueblo Indians today. In that regard, the things that we've learned about what corn farming means to Pueblo people have been really important because it, it's not just how the amount of precipitation each year affects yields, it really teaches us about the culture that we're trying to understand. And that part of the Pueblo farming project has just been invaluable to all of us here at the center. Initially, you know, um, I still probably carried sort of this dividing mindset that the white folks uh, need to just kind of be here and, you know, the Hopis would do their own thing here. I now have a collective vision on how both can work together. Research information in, in fact corroborates traditional knowledge. It's just uh, really good to see where the information but both sides are, you know, becoming compatible. I guess for me it's remarkable how many of the same concerns Pueblo farmers have and modern day agriculturalists. You know, the same kind of reverence for the land and a deep understanding of all the factors that are in play. And it's, it's a wildly complex endeavor, farming is. And just to hear different perspectives on their understanding of those factors and what they mean to them is, is really a compliment to modern agriculture. And it goes beyond modern agriculture in a lot of ways to a deeper kind of almost religious understanding 
of what it means to be a farmer and what it means to produce crops in dry land agricultural systems. It's really something much more than just planting a seed. Grandparents, they say, we derive from corn. So that's why I, like, I, I don't want it to fade away. But some, are, some things are very sacred. We can't talk about them. <laughs> Everybody gets a taste of it. Yeah, the mother and the father. Everybody. I'm moving my my family. Everybody, take a bite of this. Love the corn. The spirit corn. The mother, the father corn. That's how the the ceremony goes. Everybody takes a bite of it. See how strong that identity gets. See how strong the meaning gets to call people, that's what you are. Hmm? <laughs> Ego 